Why is 5G so hard to understand? Everything I can find about 5G is either super high level, fluffy hype content, or it's super deep and in the weeds. So today we're gonna walk the line between the two. Geek out a little bit and explore how 5G works, but not go agonizingly deep. So I've picked five of my favorite clever engineering tricks that make 5G tick. Hi, I'm Daniel Bogdanoff and welcome to the Keysight Labs channel where we think testing should be the easy part. This video is part of the Keysight University Live event. We have videos like this, interviews with industry experts, including 5G experts, and a huge test gear giveaway. Sign up using the link in the description. 5G has been a hard technology for me to squish into my brain. If you search for what is 5G or how does 5G work, you're gonna find really high level marketing floof or incredibly complex and jargon infused white papers. To get from floof to jargon, I can just pick up the phone and talk to people that worked on the 5G spec, but not everyone can do that. So this video is for the geeks who love taking things apart to see how they work. It's not a video about potential 5G applications like remote surgery or self-driving cars. The potential is super cool, but so are the pockets of technology and clever engineering tricks that together make up 5G. Here are five of them and some bonus stuff at the end. So stick around. Let's start with my favorite, beamforming. All the technologies before 5G, like 4G, 3G, 2G, and 1G, they just sprayed signals everywhere. 5G can actually form a beam and send it right to a receiver. It's called beam forming or beam steering. This works because a 5G antenna isn't just one antenna, it's an array of antennas. It's a bunch of them all piled together and they are each individually controlled components. By adjusting the phase of each antenna element, you can actually point the beam in the direction you want it to go. This is known as beam steering and can be done with simple analog phase shifters for each antenna. I know this sounds crazy, so here's an easier way to picture it. Think about ripples on water. You have two drips hitting the water and there's gonna be ripples from each drip. These ripples will constructively and destructively interfere. If you're really precise, you could change the timing of the drips and effectively move around the interference pattern. You can even pick a point and say, I wanna peek right here. You could also add more drip sources to change the size and the shape of the pattern. This is how phase arrays work, but instead of water, you have radio waves. It's so cool. This footage, by the way, is all courtesy of Sharier over at the Signal Path channel. His videos are amazing, and he's an R&D fellow at Nokia Bell Labs working on phased arrays and other cool tech. This is a phased array he actually made. Go check out his channel. Every video is like an engineering masterclass. Beam forming takes beam steering a step further and controls both the phase and the amplitude of the signal at each antenna element. With 5G beam forming, the receiver and the transmitter talk to each other to figure out what settings worked the best, basically where they got the best reception. Beam forming is important for two reasons. One is the receiver might be moving. It might be a phone and you're walking away or you're a car driving down the road. The beam has to follow and maintain the link. It's also important because the transmitter's power focuses just on the receiver. There's not a lot of energy wasted to the rest of the ether. For 4G, we could afford to spray signal everywhere, but for 5G, we can't. We can't because 5G uses much higher frequencies all the way up into the millimeter wave range. We call them millimeter wave because the wavelength is in the one to 10 millimeter range. As frequencies get higher, wireless signal loss increases the loss increases a lot. So as we go to higher frequencies, we have to use beam forming to get better reception. These higher frequencies are actually a bit of a nightmare. Loss is a really big issue. Path loss is how much power you lose between your transmitter and your receiver. Just like my two-year-old, signals lose power as they travel further. The power loss depends on the distance. The farther they go, the more power they lose, and the power loss depends on the frequency. The higher the frequency, the more power it loses per meter. 5G has specs for frequency range one, which goes up to about seven gigahertz, and frequency range two, which is in the 24 gigahertz to 52 gigahertz range. The question is, how much more loss is there by moving to those higher frequencies? Fortunately, we can calculate our free space path loss using this formula. Assuming a five meter distance, a five gigahertz signal like the Wi-Fi I'm using right now, there's 60.4 dB of loss. That means the signal gets 1.1 million times weaker when it travels 15 feet or five meters. Sure, we can recover that loss with a clever antenna design, but it's still a loss. 
However, if we go to 50 gigahertz, we have 80.4 dB of loss. That's 20 dB more loss just by changing the frequency, 110 million times less power at the receiver. And this calculation is for free space, but water and oxygen also contribute to loss in some bands as well. Beamforming helps us overcome that loss by focusing the power on the receiver. It's more efficient. So, why in the world would 5G use these higher frequencies? It's a nightmare. There's a ton of loss, there's some extra noise thrown in, and the designs are harder. If you search for an answer, the odds are you'll get the wrong one. The articles say something like, higher frequency means a higher data rate. This is very, very wrong. But 5G does have a higher data rate, insanely high data rates, because 5G uses wider bandwidths. There's an actual formula for the capacity or data rate in a link. It's called the Shannon-Hartley theorem. C is our capacity in bits per second, B is our bandwidth, and the last term is our signal to noise ratio. Notice that frequency, it's not in this formula, just bandwidth. So to increase the data rate, we just need to make B bigger, increase the bandwidth. We don't have to go to higher frequencies, we just need a wire bandwidth. That seems doable. Let's pull up the FCC's spectrum allocation chart and find ourselves some extra bandwidth. We want a 400 megahertz or 800 megahertz slice of bandwidth for 5G. 4G mainly just use 50 or 60 megahertz of bandwidth, so let's find something. Mm -hmm. Everything is pretty much taken. Okay, so if I want to live somewhere with a bigger backyard with more space, I'm going to have to move out of downtown and out in the country where there's room. That's kind of how the spectrum is. There's a lot of tech monopolizing the low frequency ranges, so to get a usable chunk of bandwidth, we have to look up in the higher frequency ranges. The olden days technology of the 1990s couldn't effectively use those ranges, but now thanks to the power of engineering, we can. With 5G's wider bandwidth, we can get over 100 times more throughput. You could stream this video in 8K. There's no free lunch though, the signal to noise ratios get a lot worse at higher frequencies, but we can work with it and work with it we shall. We can take these nice big chunks of bandwidth and then turn around and chop them up into smaller bandwidth parts, which seems like the opposite of what we were trying to achieve with our wide bandwidth. Why? Wait. Why? Just, just why? We went through all this trouble to get these big chunks of bandwidth just to turn around and break them into smaller pieces? Actually, that could make sense. My, my internet connected refrigerator probably doesn't need full 5G data rates, and the 5G soil sensor in my new cornfield, because I moved down to the country, I care more about battery life than latency. So with bandwidth parts, we can optimize portions of the carrier for different uses. We can split up our bandwidth and tweak characteristics like latency and throughput. I can have a high data rate, low latency data stream for controlling my horn harvesting robot tractor and a low energy data trickle for my soil sensor all in the same carrier. This strategy gives flexibility and allows 5G systems to tailor communications to their needs without messing up everything else around it in the carrier so my robot tractor doesn't run over my farmhouse. You can slap one bandwidth part in the middle of another part, only use a little bit of the overall carrier, or even invent something new. We don't know all the ways this is going to be used, but there's a specific space in the 5G spec for new things, all thanks to bandwidth parts. As a bonus 5G feature, you can also use multiple different carriers in different frequency ranges. For example, you could download using a fast 5G pipe in frequency range 2, but upload in frequency range 1 if you don't need that data rate. This is known as carrier aggregation. Bandwidth parts can use different data architectures or numerologies. The data protocols themselves are flexible. I'm not going to dig too deep here so you can dig into this more if it's interesting for you, but 5G and a lot of other wireless communication protocols use orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM. Basically, this means you take your carrier and you chop it up into neighboring subcarriers. Each subcarrier is shifted in phase, spaced out in frequency, and communicates data symbols, or just symbols, and it does this using some devilish RF trickery known as OFDM. The subcarriers all work together, filling up the bandwidth, or bandwidth part, to communicate information. This is why having a wider bandwidth gives us a faster data rate. We can fit in more subcarriers. As a massive overgeneralization, you can play with bandwidth parts and sizes to adjust throughput and subcarrier spacing to work with latency. Again, that's an overgeneralization. If the subcarriers are widely separated, say 240 kilohertz apart, they can transmit data very, very quickly, and we say they have a high numerology. 
This uses a lot of bandwidth because you have to spread out the subcarriers, but it gives us low latency and we can squish more symbols into a subframe. Basically, because the subcarriers are farther apart, there's less interference between subcarriers and they can transmit data faster. On the flip side, if our subcarrier spacing is small, say 15 kilohertz, it takes us longer to send data, but we use less bandwidth. LTE was limited to a fixed 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing. Here's how data actually gets passed. Every bit of 5G data you consume will go through this architecture. Data symbols are packaged up inside of frames. Each frame is 10 milliseconds long, and it's made up of one millisecond subframes. Each subframe has slots, and each slot holds a number of data symbols depending on the subcarrier spacing. If we have high numerology, we can fit more slots into a subframe. We can transmit more data in one millisecond. If we have a low numerology, we have less slots in the same time period. You can choose your numerology based on the latency you need and the bandwidth you're using, and it can be changed on the fly. It's worth noting that the user equipment, the end device, has to be designed to handle these changes in subcarrier spacing. But we want more flexibility. There are also many slots for things like high priority data packets. They throw protocol to the wind and get squished in kind of wherever they want, even into existing frames. And oh yeah, Frames are totally different than 4G LTE now, too. Okay, I know I said five things, but I just can't help myself. In LTE, subframes could be for uplink or for downlink, but not for both. That means there's latency just because we had to wait up to 10 milliseconds for a new subframe. 5G can mix uplink and downlink symbols into the same subframe, even the same slot. There are 56 different slot formats. Let's list them all. Let's not. One case where this could be handy is a control system that's requesting data. A normal communication event would be to send a control signal to the user to request data, a downlink activity, then receive data from the user, which is an uplink activity, and then acknowledge the data back to the sender, a downlink activity. In LTE, this is at least three subframes, downlink, uplink, downlink. But in 5G, this could be done in a single slot inside of a subframe. We don't have to wait to transmit data, we just have to pick the right slot format. 5G uses some really cool engineering tricks, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. We haven't even talked about open radio architectures, private networks, or the fact that 5G can be tacked onto existing LTE networks with a software update. You can keep learning as part of Keysight University Live using the link below, where today we are chatting with 5G expert Kailash Narayanan, and we're also giving away a bunch of test gear. Here are a couple of today's winners, and the rest will be drawn over at the Keysight University Live site. There's also a ton of 5G courses if you want to deep dive into this stuff. I'll see you over there.